Welcome back to um, absolutely one of my favorite events of the week. I love starting the week out this way with Shop Talks. Um, for people who are new to our community tonight or are watching this later, I'm Elizabeth Rodini. I'm the Andrew High School Arts Director here at the American Academy in Rome. And I have the pleasure of introducing tonight's speaker. Normally we pair fellows. We usually pair an artist and a scholar, as you know, but sometimes we have an odd number of fellows, which means we have one person who gets to be uh, the star of her own show. And, and that's um, the case tonight with Jean Dahmermuth. And I think Jean is the perfect person for this because her work as a painting conservator really uh, spans theory and practice in unique ways. So Jean, thank you. Thank you for <laughs> <laughs> doing this for us. Uh, Jean Dahmermuth holds the Suzanne Deal Booth Rome Prize in Historic Preservation and Conservation. And I see her here. Hello. Hi. Um, Hi. Nice to be here. Thank you so much for coming. Um, she comes to Rome from New York City, where since 1998, she has been a conservator with the group now called Art Care NYC. She holds a BA in art history from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where she wrote an honors thesis on the Venetian painter Giovanni Bellini, and where she also earned an MBA and then there must have been some interesting U-turns uh, in the years that followed and Jean returned to art history, earning an MA from the Institute of Fine Arts at NYU and then a diploma in conservation from NYU's Conservation Center with a specialization in old master painting. On completing this last degree, she became a postgraduate fellow at the Villa La Pietra, which is NYU's center in Florence and I guess that went pretty well because since 1998, she's been the Villa's consulting curator where she advises on maintenance and treatments, carries out treatments and supervises students while also serving as a lecturer at the IFA's conservation center. Jean has lectured and published on a range of topics. And I know we're in for an enlightening talk tonight because of the great conversations I've had with her around some of my own work on Gentile Bellini, who's the older brother of her BA thesis subject, Giovanni. I learned more in 20 minutes strolling around the Basque Gardens with Jean than I did in many, many hours spent in the library and archives. So um, I know we're in for a good talk. Jean's gonna speak for about 25 minutes and then we'll take questions using the raised hand function on Zoom as we did last week. Um, please make sure you're muted if you're not. And now please virtually welcome Jean Dahmermuth and her talk, Queste cose non durabili che passeranno come un'ombra. Jean. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, and thank you all for tuning in tonight. And most especially, thank you to everyone at the Academy who has made this incredible opportunity possible for me. Um, you know, for years I've seen the posters announcing the call for applications for the Rome Prize and was really inspired by the phrase time and space to think and work. And I think especially now at this very odd moment in history that time and space are really especially precious. So thank you to everyone who's made that possible. Um, so this is going to be a decidedly untheoretical talk tonight. It is literally about stuff, literally about material. And that physicality brings me to a quick disclaimer. Um, 16th century Italian art was very focused on the depiction of the human body, both male and female and both clothed and nude. So I will be showing a lot of images of nude bodies, um, which I do realize even, I, even if I don't actually mention it. And um, so my research began with what I will be referring to as the Acton painting, because it's in the Acton collection at Villa La Pietra, which is New York University's Florentine campus. And as Elizabeth, as Elizabeth mentioned, I've been involved with that collection since I was a Samuel H. Kress conservation fellow there now 25 years ago. The field of conservation really has two main aspects one being preservation and the other presentation. 
And what the general public usually sees is the presentation side, making artworks look better, or at least someone's idea of better. And that can include removing discolored varnishes to reveal the colors of the paint, or inpinning losses to let the image be read more clearly. But just as important is the preservation side, trying to help slow processes of deterioration. And that includes advising on climate conditions and handling procedures and identifying and stopping problems like say flaking paint before they become larger problems like lost paint. And to that end, we do surveys of objects recording their conditions at a given time to be compared with another looking for any changes. Five years ago, I was at La Piedra with two NYU students, Kim Frost and Sarah Mastrangelo, doing condition, condition checks on a group of paintings, including this one. Now, the Acton Collection is only now being, um, beginning to be truly studied. And so some objects have some information available about them. But for this one, we had nothing, no provenance, no attribution more precise than Florentine 16th century, and no title more precise than mythological subject. All the information we had was the painting itself. And the only tools we had were low magnification, a measuring tape, and our eyes. But seeing a painting in person can tell you a lot. And here I'm really focusing on texture which is generally not evident in photographs. And that is intentional because official portraits, as it were, of paintings are generally specifically lit to eliminate as much texture as possible. But when you see paintings in person, that texture is apparent. And I have to say, I always take a bit when people describe paintings as two-dimensional. Um, first of all, not to be that way, but everything in this physical universe has to be three-dimensional or more, depending on how you're describing physics. Um, but also because when a conservator is treating a painting, doing that presentation side, repairing a tear or filling an in painting lost paint, it's the third dimension that's tricky. Just matching color is easy, but matching the texture, the gloss, the translucency of paint, so that the damage isn't distracting to the viewer, that's the hard part that requires skill and judgment and creativity. The texture of a painting is only partly created by the paint, but more determined by underlayers, which are like the foundations of a building. So they're not obvious, but they're certainly necessary. And this diagram shows all the layers of a painting, starting with the support, which is generally, either a wooden panel or a stretched canvas. And the support often dominates the texture. This is also then affected by things that have happened to the painting as it has aged. Maybe the panel has cracked or the canvas torn and the paint will also crack over time and that creates its own texture. So in this painting on panel, you can see little splits in the wood where the fibers of the wood have moved or come apart a little bit as the painting has aged. Because it's always good to remember that wood starts out as a tree, it has its own internal structure, and then that wood is shaped into forms that people find useful. But that underlying internal structure can become apparent over time, at least in person, because these sorts of things of planar distortions are generally disguised in photographs. But here, for example, you can see a crack in the wood of, um, in the wood panel of Raphael's Transfiguration. So most 16th century Florentine paintings are on panel. And there are many practical, theoretical, and traditional reasons for that, that I don't have to have time to demonstrate um, this evening. So I'm gonna ask you to take my word for it. And also asking you to accept that this isn't necessarily true elsewhere. So most 16th century Venetian paintings are on canvas. And from about 1600 on, most Florentine paintings are also on canvas. But in 16th century Florence, and really more broadly Tuscany and generally central, uh, central Italy, and also going back earlier in time, about 75 to 90% of the paintings are on panel. But 
But these same artists did sometimes use canvas and that would have been a deliberate choice rather than a default action. And the choice likely would relate to the function that the painting was intended to serve. The acting painting is one of these anomalies. And here you can see the texture of the canvas. And that, along with the fact that nobody had a good explanation for the subject, nor a plausible attribution, started my research in this area, thinking that maybe by starting literally where the painter did, I could figure out what this was. So starting by really thinking about what canvas is, looking at a woven textile up close, there are two sets of threads perpendicular to each other. One set is vertical, so in this example, white threads, and the other horizontal, in this example, black threads. They weave over and under each other, and the simplest type of weave is just over one, under one, maybe like the potholders that you made in summer camp. Here, the threads sometimes go over or under more than one thread to create a pattern of black and white that is also a textural pattern. These textiles are woven on looms and the vertical threads are called the warp and are strung on the loom. The weaver sits at the loom and pulls some of the, thread, the warp threads up and others down, creating a shed between them. Then the horizontal thread, the weft, which is one long thread wrapped around a shuttle, which is pretty stiff, is passed through that thread by the weaver, passing it from one hand to another. Then the position of the warp threads is changed, so pulling others up and others down, and then passing the shuttle back through. And the weaver repeats that action over and over again, creating the woven textile. Before about 1800, all looms were hand looms. After that, mechanized looms took over, so most modern textiles have very different qualities than hand woven textiles. First, our modern textiles are very tightly woven together because they're made with the force of machines. While hand-woven textiles are somewhat looser, which isn't to say they're not fine, but they have more air in them. The second difference is that on a hand loom, the width of the textile is limited to the distance that the weaver can pass the shuttle from one hand to another which is generally about a meter to a meter and a quarter. The length, meanwhile, is determined by the length of the warp threads. And so a woven textile can literally be as long as a piece of string. But this width limitation means that any painting on canvas wider in the short direction than about a meter must be sewn together from more than one width of canvas and thus must have a seam and that seam will show texturally. So for example, likely many of you have seen a represent, uh, reproduction of this painting and many of you have seen it in person, but you may be unaware that it is painted on canvas and that canvas texture is clearly visible in person. And that because it is well over a meter in the short direction, so here the height, that there is a seam where there are two pieces of canvas were sewn together and that seam is clearly visible as a slightly raised ridge. The Acton painting actually has two seams, a short horizontal one going partway across the surface and a long vertical one going the entire height. These hand woven textiles were not cheap. And so you often see frugal use being made of what was available. So this has been pieced together to make up the necessary size. There's one long piece with the warp running vertically. And then there are two smaller pieces that are off cuts turned 90 degrees so that the warp is running horizontally. The painting didn't need to be as wide as two widths of the canvas and the painter didn't want to trim off extra and have that be wasted. And I don't have time to go into the details of my logic um, this evening, but I would argue that this means that an exact size was required, which often was not the case. And that, that suggests that this was intended for a specific location. In turning now to some of the reasons 
that a 16th century Florentine painter might have used canvas instead of panel, the most obvious and most studied reason is for banners that were carried in processions. And they can generally be identified first through their subject matter and because they're generally vertical in format. They also needed to be a size that was easily portable, with, which neatly lines up with the width of a single canvas because both are determined by a human scale. So banners generally don't have any scenes. And of course there are exceptions. So then there are all the paintings that weren't banners. And these are really what I'm focused on trying to understand why a painter chose this support in specific instances. And many of the reasons have been discussed, but not in a very systematic way. So for example, canvas is lighter weight than wood and is flexible. So it can sometimes be rolled, making it more practical, practical to transport. It was also cheaper to buy and less time consuming to prepare than panels. So there could be economic reasons to use canvas. There could also be aesthetic reasons, particularly a desire to look more like a Venetian painting. When these reasons are clear for any given painting, that's really helpful because then I can work back to other paintings that are possibly um, fall into the same category. But first of all, there are many examples that contradict these reasonings. So for example, Raphael's huge transfiguration was painted in Rome and was meant to be sent to Mar Narbonne. Um, and yet it is painted on wood rather than canvas that would have been easier to transport. And it still leaves many paintings on canvas unexplained. And so I'm trying to find other explanations as well. I'm particularly focusing on temporary decorations. And in doing this research, I came across this quote about the dismantling of the decorations made for the entry of Pope Leo X in 1515. Queste cose non durabili che passarono come un'ombra. These flimsy things that pass like a shadow or a ghost, depending on your reading. They were made as ephemera, not built to last. And so the sculptures were made out of paper mache or maybe unfired clay rather than marble or even wood. And the paintings were painted on canvas, which was quicker and cheaper than panel, but also less durable. And you can think of the difference in durability, something like a canvas tent versus a wooden shed. Decorations fall into at least two broad categories. The first are parade floats or edifici, most often made for carnival processions. So we are just at the right time of year. And there are contemporary descriptions of these, but no real depictions of these. So these that I'm showing you are more sort of fantasy image, images that would have been similar to the real thing. And you can imagine them something like Mardi Gras parades in New Orleans, which are incredibly elaborate public spectacles that are temporary. So imagine the floats being made of real wooden carts that were pulled by horse and, horses or oxen or donkeys, covered with elaborate temporary decorations, some painted and some sculptural, and also that real people in elaborate costumes were riding on them and walking along beside them, singing songs and playing music. And in fact, in fact, it's the songs that have survived the best because people kept singing them. Meanwhile, there were individual paintings on these cards. And in fact, there are a handful of these that survive and are known. For example, this is one of a group of paintings attributed to Andrea del Sarto and painted for Carnival in 1513. So then the, the second big category of temporary decorations were those set up along parade routes through the city. For example, for the entrance of a royal bride before a wedding. And these structures could include triumphal arches, statues, and obelisks, all designed by the most important architects and artists of the day. And we don't really have any close modern equivalent for this. So maybe think of a cross between a Biennale and a ticker tape parade. And we also don't have a good English word for it. So um, I've been using the Italian apparati. There also would have been structures entirely covering the facades of buildings, 
kind of like backdrops for a theater set. And they would have been built out of wood. And again, the sculptures would be made out of paper mache and the paintings that decorated them like frescoes would be painted on canvas. So we do have some images of these, especially from the later part of the century. The image on the left is one peplo, one of more than a dozen, made for the Medici wedding of 1589. And on the right is the painting that was above the central doorway. And that painting is enormous. It's almost six and a half meters wide. Now, all of these events were propaganda and the uses and abuses of propaganda are something to think about. And I think particularly in relating to the Academy's theme this year of the city, there's something to think about superimposing one's own image and one's own symbols onto the image of a city in the eyes and minds of the inhabitants of the world and thus sort of laying claim to that space. And that's definitely something to think about even if it's not my focus this evening. So going back to the Acton painting, I had a hunch that this might be from an operato. And this was really just a hunch that I was following. In looking at events that it might possibly have been made for and narrowing down the dates stylistically and also looking at imagery and frankly then doing some creative reading of texts and some uh, creative math about measurements and a long story for another evening uh, short, I found where it very likely came from uh, in the operato for the Medici wedding of 1565, which enabled it both to be attributed to a very obscure painter who was an assistant to Bronzino and to identify the subject, which is a fairly obscure allegory. So that riddle solved, I thought maybe I could find more, which leads me to my work here in Rome. And the first thing was to identify possible candidates. So I've been building a spreadsheet of paintings of interest, works that are on canvas with pertinent facts like dimensions about them. Um, and I'm up to um, about 125 such paintings and I, I seem to find sort of more every day. I'm not sure when I'm gonna to get to the end of this. And then I've been building dossiers on each of those paintings, including written and photographic evidence. And um, especially useful are photographs that I have taken in person so that uh, show the texture and show um, um, uh, seaming and um, other aspects of the, um, of the text. So at this point, I have a few paintings that have jumped out at me as being of particular interest, let's say. Um, and one of these is a group of paintings known as the Press Landscapes, because they were owned by the Samuel H. Kress Foundation between 1936 and 1937, at which point they were given to the newly created National Gallery in Washington. There's also another canvas that has long been associated with them because it is similar in style and size, which is a kind of fantasy version of Florence turned into a harbor. In 1962, Federico Zeri put these and several other paintings together on stylistic grounds as a work of one painter whom he called the master of the crest landscapes. Then in 1998, Lewis Waldman found the contract for this altarpiece, giving a real name to this painter, Giovanni Larchani, and putting back together much of his biography. But no one has ever really accounted for why these paintings, alone of all works attributed to Larchani, are painted on canvas, or what this size and shape of a painting would have been used for, or why that canvas was clearly stretched up quickly, severely distorting the canvas weave, or why the paint was applied very thinly, let alone what most of the figures other than Narcissus here are doing, or why these are essentially landscapes when, at, at a time when this was really only beginning to appear as a separate genre. But all of these things and the detail, which has long been noted, of the Medici stemma on the flag of the ship sailing into, into Florence Harbor would make perfect sense 
if they were from the Edifizi for the carnival of 1513, just after the penultimate return of the Medici. So this is another hunch, which along with other paths, I'll be exploring during this time and space that I have here at the Academy. And really sort of taking a cue from something that Avi Noam has said several times about taking risks in scholarship, because this may not pan on out at all. This may be a total dead end. It may just be chasing shadows, or it could turn out to be a new way of understanding these paintings. But who knows? Stay tuned. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. That was great. I love the love the raw <laughs> against the polished museum photography. We see so much. <laughs> Um, so we're going to use the raise hand function and I, and, and that's under your little reactions button. Um, and I'm going to do my best to, you know, follow these in some sort of logical thread as best I can. Um, oh, I thought I saw a hand, but I think it was clapping hands. Uh, <laughs> would anyone, would anyone like to start with a question? Oh, those are clapping hands. These little hand icons are hard. And I am an art historian, I should be able to tell. Uh, Lynn, yours is a raised hand. Yeah, I, Jean, I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about that wooden um, facade that had the canvases on them that I've never heard of anything like that before. So, so part of the idea was to make Florence look better. And I think that there was a, so you sort of read these kind of descriptions that they were a little bit, and especially in 1565, they were a little bit worried about how they were gonna look. Um, they were having this whole retinue of, of imperial um, um, courtiers coming. And they were a little bit worried about how this was gonna look. So they wanted everything to look, they wanted to spruce everything up. So um, there were several of these, in addition to there being sort of arches that you actually walked through, this was literary, literally a temporary facade. So I, I, it's sort of like a scaffolding, I imagine, of a sort of wooden scaffolding that entirely covered the, um, the facade of this building and that, um, that one in particular, which is where the, uh, this, this uh, painting comes from, is in front of um, uh, Palazzo Riccazzoli. And so you come down Borgo Anisanti and you see this at the end. So it, it would have been sort of the, the focal point at, a, at an end of, of, a, of, a, of a long street. And so it, it literally sort of covered the entire thing and um, was kind of a much more modern spruced up um, architecture that had these enormous paintings um, and a, a total of five really large paintings with different sort of scenes on them that, that you know, would have been, say, sort of like the, the entire facade would have been like three stories high. So, uh, I mean, the, the just sort of expense spent on this um, and really for, you know, basically sort of two or three weeks that it was, that was left up um, was really kind of a, sort of very impressive. It reminds me of these um, these scaffoldings where they're working on the building, and then you you pay, uh, you know, to get advertisements. But a lot of them actually have the the image of mm -hmm. the itself on there. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Great, thank you. Um, I don't know. I think you were next. Thank you, thank you, Jean, for your lecture. I really enjoyed that. Uh, if I may. Uh, you know, think about what you are saying. Your thesis is about mobility and ephemerality that created the uh, then the move from the wood into the canvas. Um, uh, in your case, and I, I I wonder about it because I you might be also looking at the histories of flags uh, because I I remember. Um, looking at uh, specific flags that had um, painting on them. That means, I mean, I'm talking about Islamic flags that they uh, were using textile, but instead of having the normal woven decoration on the flag that usually is used in parades and 
you have a lot of time to prepare and you can prepare it with wool and gold and then have a whole decoration on it. They started to paint also flags with gold color in order to produce flags quickly. Mm -hmm. Now I'm saying that because now what is happening is not only the idea of the ephemerality and the portability, which is easier because both are easy to port, to, 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 to move from one place to another, the woven one and the other one which is painted. But the one which is painted is quicker in production. And then you realize that actually in the Ottoman court, before a war, you need a lot of flags and you don't have the time to do this beautiful flag. So you start to paint flags and to produce them. So I'm just thinking if you can also think of the idea of ephemerality and mobility with the question of the quick production. I don't know if it's, it is right in your case, maybe mm -hmm. it's not. And the production uh, on canvas it will take the same time as, as on wood, but it seems to me that someone is taking a, a, some decision about canvas and painted canvas for ephemeral uh, parade that might also need a kind of a deadline behind mm -hmm. them. Um, this is just one thing that I thought of bringing into um, the discussion. The second is about the, um, it's very nice that you, you, you trained our eye to look at the painting as a three-dimensional uh, object. You know, I'm, I'm arguing to it for a, for a carpet, but I never thought to argue for it also for a painting and you're totally right. I mean, we're not talking about Van Gogh, which is, would be obvious, we're mm -hmm. talking about painting. The only question that I have is when do we paint and what should we see? when do we want to show the, the ground and the support? And when do we want that the viewer will not see it? Um, is that something that you can also take into consideration when you discuss the uh, painting as revealing ground? I don't know if, if, if the artist would have liked us, our eye to reveal it, and if it is your gaze now as a restorer and the, um, and the gaze of the camera that created this uh, situation. Just asking, uh, happy to hear. I mean, I think, I think, I mean, definitely one of one of the differences when when um, artists are, when when artists are are really sort of do have the that let's say time is not necessarily a a, a factor. Um, I th I think that they were very aware of the different look that. Uh, Canvas would give, and and um, that's where sort of so, especially in in Venice, and especially with someone like Titian, he was really using um, often very coarse canvases to that that when he applied the paint, it would actually break up the brushwork so that it wouldn't it wouldn't be um, sort of one continuous um, smooth look, and it kind of it kind of has more of an air of uh, more of a, a feeling of the air between you and an object, right? It sort of has literally sort of a sense of more atmosphere. So, and there, there are, say for example, several Raphael portraits that are on canvas and they have this very sort of different um, feeling to them, um, which in a, in a way is more kind of realistic. You sort of, you sort of it has more, more of a sense of a, of a momentary glimmer of light to it. Um, so I think, you, you know, you can also look at whether this is very fine canvas, which is in which the the texture is basically obliterated by the um, by the uh, um, ground layer that you put on it, or if it's really rough text uh, canvas that is is clearly sort of meant to um, meant to show. And so I think that that you know that's also sort of um, uh, kind of comes into into play about um, the, the just sort of these aesthetic reasons. Um, and, and to your earlier point about, about time, I think, I think time was very much a factor. And so um, sometimes they had a fair amount of time to prepare for these events, but there were also a lot of funerals that were decorated. And so you, you didn't necessarily, there were, there were some people who actually 
um, pre-planned their funerals um, and had banners sort of already made. But if they were um, a funeral, which oftentimes it was more like a, an obsequiary, right? So it, the, the, it's not that you're actually burying a body, but you're sort of honoring somebody um, who has died. But you still only have sort of like a month or two to get this all ready. Um, so very much this um, having uh, uh, the speed of the, of the work on canvas was was um, sort of a big part of it. Um, but I think I, I think your part of your point about the the flags and the and the Ottoman connection are um, really a, an, an interesting thing to look into. And I think you know because now. When, say, for example, we're decorating for a ticker tape parade or, or any kind of parade like that, it's really flags that are used to, to uh, uh, decorate the, the space that um, is around. And so it still sort of has that same um, kind of feeling, but in a, in a less uh, creative uh, um, and, and um, varied kind of way, so. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. I think the next person with the hand up was Maggie. Maggie. Hi, Jean. Um, thank you so much for that talk. This is really interesting to hear your take on these sort of ephemeral art um, artworks and architecture for these uh, recessions. I had a few questions kind of on the theme of ephemerality. So um, I first became aware of these kind of objects when I was looking at Roman triumphal architecture because, um, you know, the families in the Medici, other families and popes would use these kind of ephemera to decorate ancient Roman triumphal monuments for these kind of processions. And then, like you said, they'd stay up for a few weeks and then they'd come down. So they're sort of usurping the Roman triumphal monuments, but in this ephemeral way. And it always struck me as really different from what Roman emperors were doing, where they were not temporarily imposing their images on the city, but making the city permanently in their image. Um, and so I guess my first question is sort of, if you have any sense of why um, these political and religious leaders in the time period you're studying were sort of were satisfied with ephemera over permanent monuments. Um, and then on the flip side though, it was really fascinating to see that some of these have survived because we do think of them as ephemeral, but it, it seems that they were saved and somehow, you know, if they come down to us today, they weren't thrown away after they were used. And I, I guess I wonder if you have a sense of um, you know, whether these were cut up and, and were they displayed and in that sense actually outlived their supposedly ephemeral quality? I mean, I think the, I think some aspects were actually permanent. So there were also frescoes that were done in the Portile of the Plaza Vecchio. Um, and there are some other, um, uh, facades of buildings that were frescoed as part of this. Um, I mean, I, I went, for example, for this temporary facade of Palazzo Riccosoli, it basically sort of took over the facade of somebody else's building and covered up their windows. So um, you wouldn't have actually been able to live in that sort of for very long. And I think a, a lot of these other sort of, uh, you know, triumphal arches and that sort of thing, there wouldn't have actually been space um, uh, to do that. Um, but you know, I, I I sort of also think about something, and I can't remember somebody somebody long ago. I remember saying that the things that you remember are the things that almost never happened, right? So you don't remember every day after day, but you remember um, you know like a like a special trip, or you remember a special um, birthday party that you went to, and I I wonder if almost psychologically you you create that image and then people sort of think about oh do you remember when that was you know sort of so uh so wonderful and and um that, that creates sort of a different sort of impression than some even something that you walk by every day and there were sort of a few things that, that people would do that um and then yes they were kept and there are which sort of something else i'm sort of plotting let's say um that some of these pieces from, from these operati were saved and reused. And sometimes they were actually reused for other similar events. So if it was, if you sort of um, did a, uh, an image and it was, you know, 
Florence triumphant over something else, right? Um, that would be easily reusable just sort of as it is. There are also sort of examples where they've adapted. So if it was one person's funeral and they made it into somebody else's funeral by sort of changing a few of the, of the details. Um, a few of them were the, like the, the, the giant one from 1589. That and a few other from that set were saved. And again, they were sort of um, um, useful subjects, let's say, were saved and were used as decorations at Palazzo Pitti. So they were actually sort of mounted on the wall. Um, and sometimes they actually just reused the canvas as canvas because again, sort of they weren't into throwing things away. So there, there are all of these sort of records of these being in deposits. Um, and one thing I think is kind of interesting is that between um, say 1563 and 65 or so, there were um, multiple of, of these um, operati, including the, the funeral for um, uh, Michelangelo. And if you sort of add up all of the canvas that would, they would have needed, it's something like a kilometer of canvas that they would have needed. And so there's no way that they just threw all of that away and that they may have reused it. And it would actually be interesting because it's also sort of then a moment when there are many more um, permanent paintings on canvas, many more portraits and different things on campus. And I actually wonder whether some of those portraits were actually reused from something else and that if you x-rayed them and if you really studied them, if you would be able to find other images um, kind of underneath that, which, which there are a few sort of examples where, where people have found other things uh, that, that were um, sort of underneath. Um, Thank you. Um, I just want to make a quick comment, which was you really, I, I was always really aware of how laborious panel preparation was, but just to think that all of that canvas had to be woven. I mean, not in the yeah. artist's studio, but I think we think, oh, you just go to the store and get the canvas. That's the easy thing to do. Mm -hmm. but yeah, this was also a really labor intensive process. So that, that was interesting. Mm -hmm. so we have a lot of questions and I don't want to um, overrun the time too much. Um, I would uh, like to ask you to ask a really, you know, try to be as concise as you can in your questioning and we'll get through uh, the ones that remain, I think, but let's try and, you know, okay. question on the head, please. And I guess, I think the next person was Robert. Oh, no, no, I'm sorry, Steve. Steve masquerading as, as Molly. I mean, unless it was Molly with the question. We're actually gonna alternate every word. Okay. Uh, 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 I, yeah, my question is, is quick. Um, I'm curious about the practice of making costumes and making these paper mache items. Uh, and if it was a communal act between regular people or were there specialists that were involved or what, if you know anything about that process? Um, the, the sculptures and the, and the costumes, I don't know so very much about, um, but, I, but I do know that it was really sort of all hands on deck. Like for the, the 1565 wedding, um, they basically employed anyone who was part of the Painters Guild or was an apprentice doing that or um, uh, any, anybody who could sort of um, uh, be useful in doing that because they had to get them done uh, in a fair amount of time. And actually there's sort of very good descriptions of the costumes because that was actually, costumes were always sort of like the really expensive part because those textiles were, were really expensive. Thanks. Uh, good question. Robert. Hi. Uh, also, it, just with the interest of making this super, super quick, um, I really appreciated the, the study of the seeming um, that you, you described at the beginning of the lecture, and specifically how that was used to make paintings of a particular size or a particular aspect ratio. But I'm wondering, with that structure of seeming um, interior to the picture plane, have you found evidence that those seams have uh, informed or structured the compositional strategies of the paintings as well? Um, you, you know, if, I mean, I, th I think because themes are one of these things that people have not documented in a very systematic way. Um, generally with any seam or with any um, panel join as well, you tend to not want it to interrupt uh, um, an important part of the composition, right? Because it's, over time, it's going to become more apparent. Um, and then also, if you have a horizontal seam, the bottom piece is actually hanging off that seam, which is not a very structurally stable um, uh, uh, um, structure. 
Um, so in general, you would want to try to avoid that, which in my mind is also sort of a reason why if you have lots of seams or if they're put together in a um, kind of haphazard way, it may be more suggestive that they weren't sort of worried about the long term, right? That you know, it would be, it would be fine for a couple of weeks. Um, and and um, truthfully, although this is like a, a totally different can of worms, um, the um, Botticelli's Birth of Venus. Nobody actually knows who who commissioned that and why. And there's there is a theory that it was meant as a temporary decoration. And to me, having that horizontal seam when you could have actually done two vertical seams that would have been structurally more stable um, is is also sort of evidence of um, evidence of that. I love how your work is so much detective work. It's great. Um, I think we love, <laughs> maybe they got m moved on. So we have Kati. And then if we have time, Corinna would like to ask a question as well, I think. So maybe Kati and then Corinna. Great. Um, thank you so much, Jean. That was fascinating. Um, I'm, I also have some quest a question kind of returning to the kind of aesthetic qualities of the, the canvas versus panel. So, you know, this idea that it, you know, the support as an indicator of function is a really interesting way in. And I was wondering if there's more to be said about the kind of discourse around canvas versus panel. Like, you know, we know that the kind of, or, you know, there's the kind of colorito diseño ideas of like what you mentioned Titian, you know, versus what was going on elsewhere. Is there, is, can we read any more discourse into that? Is there more, is there anything that they were saying about these choices at the time? You know, I, I need, I need to, let's say, go back to Vasari and see what he actually says. I mean, he, he talks about canvas as being this convenient method that was developed in Venice and that it's really useful and he sort of has reasons why that is useful. But it's also sort of, he sort of feels like if you're, if you're sort of properly, you know, Tuscan, masculine, sculptural, logical, rational, um, you should be using panel. And they're, they're, uh, um, the aesthetic of panel really sort of like backs up with all of that. Um, but, but I haven't actually sort of come across anything where anybody is actually sort of saying, you, you know, canvas is this and panel is that. And I don't know whether it's just that they sort of took that for granted. Um, but again, I, th I think you, you could sort of read into some of these things that, um, uh, let's say then relate to their Tuscan paintings, but they relate to um, Venetian paintings, either that somebody had just gone there or that it was matching other um, uh, um, uh, paintings that, that were um, Venetian. And so I, I, it's, it's the kind of thing that I'm, I'm hoping I'm gonna be able to sort of put that back together um, kind of obliquely, because I haven't actually read anything where anybody actually said that. It may have just been so obvious to them that, that that's what they sort of understood, so. Now we can all look out for that in our own reading. Corina, last question. Hi, thank you. Um, my question might be silly, but I was wondering, wondering if there is any chance that, that, that we are applying the concept of Efer, Efer and, uh, I can't say that, Efer, uh, thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, in a wrong way, um, I mean, are we sure that they were aware of the Efer, Efer whatever, the caducity <laughs> of the canvas. Um, and if is that something that we can as assume, can we also imagine that maybe the same caducity of the canvas led um, to choose canvas at the place of wood uh, that increase maybe the, 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 the value of the object itself? So that could explain. I, I I mean, I think, and, and the, I mean, well, last point first, the economics of this, and this actually goes at, at least in the 17th century and sort of then all over Europe when, uh, let's say Rembrandt was using both canvas and, and panel. Um, and that is sort of gonna take some picking apart of contracts to sort of see what the price differential was and if there was a significant um, price differential. Um, I mean, I think, what, what I do think is that our idea of, um, of ephemera would be that they wouldn't have, it's true that they wouldn't have had this idea of ephemera, 
right? Um, but I think, you know, this sort of quote about these things being non durabili, right? That, that they sort of understood that this wasn't, this wasn't going to last either as an ensemble because the ensemble was going to be taken apart. Um, and that these pieces weren't, I mean, that you, you weren't going to be able to say, put a um, carta pesta sculpture um, outside in the way that you that you could um, a marble sculpture. So you know that they that they were sort of aware of, um, but they weren't anything like as wasteful as we are, right? So they, they, what, there wasn't the sort of idea that you oh it's just paper so you can like you can just throw it away or it's you know I mean they reused everything and they um, you know this idea of piecing these these canvases together was really that you you didn't want to waste this. So um, you, you made the most of what you had and then you made sort of something else out of it. So it's true that sort of, um, uh, I should maybe look into the history of the word ephemera, right? Because um, it's, it's, it, it, it's true that it means a different thing. It means a different things to us now. And, and that, that is really sort of the, the um, industrial revolutions, which sort of then made these materials cheap um, and sort of changed our, our relationship. To Thank you, Jean. That was really fascinating. Uh, thanks to everyone for their great questions. Thanks to Suzanne Deal Booth for being here and joining us too. That was really nice to see. Um, bravo. I really enjoyed it. Thank you. Thank you, Jean. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Take care.